honor. And this is part four of that series. And today, as has been said, we're looking at this issue of, of conflict. Most followers of Jesus Christ don't like conflict. There are probably a few out there and maybe a few in here that actually like conflict. It's like, bring it on. But most, most Christ followers um, don't, don't actually like conflict. In Romans chapter 12, it says, If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. So the, the, the heart of a Christian, the desire of a Christian should be to live at peace with everyone. But that's not always possible. Conflict does happen because we are sinful people. And dealing with conflict in the right way can go a long way in helping us to cultivate a culture of honor and actually strengthen our relationships. On the other hand, dealing with conflict the wrong way can be painful, it can be dishonoring, and it can damage relationships. So our desire should be to deal with conflict in the right way. And we'll see what Jesus has to say about this from the Gospel of Matthew. In Matthew chapter 16, uh, Jesus asked his disciples, Who do you say that I am? And Peter said, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus is the Messiah, the anointed one of God. He is the Savior. He's God's own Son. And through faith in the Messiah, through faith in Jesus, we get forgiveness of sins. Through Jesus Christ, it's possible for us to be in right standing with God on the basis of grace. And this forgiveness that we get through Jesus is a gift. On the cross, Jesus paid the price, the penalty for our sin in full, once and for all. Praise God. That's the gospel. He is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus responds to Peter with these words, which are a massive bold, visionary statement. The words of Christ in response. He says in Matthew 16, verses 17 and 18, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Matthew is the only gospel account that contains the word church. Matthew records Jesus using this word three times. This is the first time. And at this point in history, the church was still being formed. This is why Jesus is talking about the church in terms of what he is going to build. There's a futuristic sense in the words of Jesus. And the word church means assembly. It means congregation. It's the gathering of God's people under the headship of Jesus Christ. Church is not a building. Praise God for buildings. And he's blessed us with a fantastic building. But we could meet under a tree and be a church. Because church is 
people, the people who have put their faith in Christ. And it's Jesus' church. He is committed to building his church. And he has promised that the powers of hell, the gates of Hades, the place of the dead, will not overcome his church. Let's be clear that Jesus is for his church. And as his followers, we too should be for his church. The second and third time that Matthew records using the word church is two chapters later. And it's in the context of teaching how to resolve conflict among church members. Conflict which eventually ends up in church discipline. Conflict that is not dealt with properly in a church context like this can cause members to live in disunity. Can cause members to wander away. It can give the gates of hell an opening to attack the church. And Jesus shows us a way to work with him in his work, his commitment to build his church and protect his church from the gates of hell. It's true that there is an enemy, the devil who hates Jesus, hates his church, and will do whatever he can to destroy the church. Jason made reference to John chapter 10. Frank made reference to John chapter 10. About how Jesus came to give us life and life more abundantly. Well, before that, it speaks about one who has come to steal, kill, and destroy. So there's this struggle. There's this wrestling between the destroyer, the killer, and what Jesus is trying to do, which is to build his, his church. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 18. We'll read three verses, 15 through 17. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church... And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. If your brother or sister... Last week, we looked at how we honor each other as different groups in the church. And and what we saw last week is that the church is a family. Fathers, mothers, brothers, sisters. It's your brother, it's your sister. We are a family. And what what, what do we do with family? Well, we're supposed to protect family. We're supposed to honor family. There will be times, however, when your brother sins against you. There will be times when your sister sins against you because we are sinful. To sin means to miss the mark. I was, I was aiming to, to do that. I was supposed to do that. I, I, I couldn't. I missed the mark. It, it means to be in error. To sin means to be guilty of wrong. There's something wrong that I've done and I am, I'm a guilty party. 
in another translation, it says, it doesn't say if your brother and sister sins, it says if they sin, sins against you, sins against you. So there is a, a personal dynamic to the offense. You are the one who has been injured by what has happened. Now, as Christians, our, our sins hurt our relationship with God and they hurt our relationship with each other. You might be here, however, as someone who hasn't yet embraced the Christian message fully. Perhaps you're still exploring this message of Christianity. And one of the reasons you're still exploring is because you think that Christians are this group of perfect people. You look from the outside and you think, man, the Christian is he's just so, so perfect. Doesn't mess up or at least gives the impression perfect. And you're thinking, I could never be part of that group. Well, the truth is, Christians are not perfect. Christians have received the gift of eternal life. Christians have been given new spiritual life. They have been forgiven. And God is working in them so that they don't want to sin. They have a different desire that's in them not to sin. But Christians still sin. Still mess up. And if if that's your hurdle, like I... I can't join a, a group of perfect ones because I'm not perfect. Well, the news is, dear friends, we're not perfect. And you'll fit right in. So welcome. Join us. Receive this gift from Jesus Christ. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault. Literally means go and convict them of their sin. Go and lay bare their sin. Go and expose their sin. Some of us are thinking, oh boy, I'd love to do that. Oh yeah, just, just give me a try. Lay it bare, expose it. Yeah. But hang on, let's just read on. It says, just between the two of you. Just between the two of you. That is how we honor each other when conflict arises. When, when, when I have offended you, when I have hurt you because I'm sinful, well, it's just between the two of us. Makes you think of that song. Just the two of us. We can make it if we try. We can make it if we try. If, if, if you and I come together and, and the two of us try and, and, and resolve it, we, we can make it if we try. God can, God can help us. Go to them. Back then, the, the different means of communication were, were fairly limited. You could write someone a letter. A lot of the New Testament is, is letters. Um, you could send someone on your behalf, hey, please go and speak to so-and-so. Today, we have a much larger array of um, communication options. I can send an email, uh, a WhatsApp message, Facebook. I don't know much about Instagram, but I think you can use Instagram as well. 
different ways of, of communicating. But this instruction still applies. Go and point out their fault. Go and physically be with them. Go and speak with them. That is the honorable thing to do. Face to face. And to be honest, friends, this is not easy. It takes a woman of honor. It takes a man of honor to say, you know what, I've been hurt, I've been offended, I'm going to go to my brother or sister and I'm going to tell them this is what's happened, we need to talk. One of the ways we can mess this up is instead of the issue being just between the two of us, others are pulled in. Before we go to them, we have gone to others. Sometimes we don't even go to them. Conversations are happening here when they should be happening there with the person in question. If they listen to you, it goes on to say, you have won them over. The issue between the two of you has been resolved. Now, if, if you have to win them over, it means that when this sin happens, when this issue arises, it means you have lost your brother. You have lost your sister. There's, there's something major that's come in between you and, and, and the re- relationship is, is broken. To, to win them back means you have, you have gained them. You, you, you have restored relationships. So, so the, the objective here is to restore. It's to resolve. It's to reconcile. It's to see that broken relationship restored. That's the purpose. And if you have won your brother or sister just between the two of you, the issue is closed. Doesn't need to go any further. It's done. To Memaliza. I came to you. We spoke. I've won you over. Case closed. No one else in the church even needs to know. And, and, And most of the Conflict resolution that happens in the church should be happening in that way. In the normal course of life, I've sinned against you, you've sinned against me, I go to Sode, Sode, hey, listen, this is what's happened because the Spirit of God is working in Sode, because grace is at work in his heart. He's like, man, I see what's happened here. Oh, man, let's, let's, let's work this out. Let's resolve this. And no one else needs to know. We, we move on. In fact, our relationship is strengthened by the fact that we have been able to humble ourselves before each other and sort things out. You've won over your brother or your sister. Just the two of us. We can make it if we try. But if they will not listen... Take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they will not listen. This this word listen here, it's more than just hearing. Oh, they, they, they heard my words. It's more than just hearing. This word listen means to heed. It means acting on what you have said. So the reason that just the two of us can resolve is because there's been some action based on what I've said. But if they do not listen, if they do not heed, if they do not act on what has been said, well, take one or two others along. You go to one or two others, you explain to them, this is what's happened. 
I've, I've tried to work it out with my brother. I've tried to work it out with my sister. It hasn't worked. I need your help. And Jesus quotes from the law. He quotes from uh, Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15, which says, One witness is not enough to convict anyone accused of any crime or offense they may have committed. A matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. So it's now something that needs to be dealt with by the community, by the church. But it's not everyone in the community, in the church that's involved. One or two more people is enough. Those one or two more people is added to you, which makes the two or three, and the two or three is sufficient. This is how we maintain the culture of honor as we try to resolve conflict, as we're working through issues in the church. You now have two or three people laying bare the sin of this brother or sister. Hopefully these additional voices, hopefully the collective wisdom that comes from being in a family will help. Hopefully involving others communicates the seriousness of this matter and will lead to a softening of hearts and a change of mind. That's the hope. The hope is still reconciliation, restoration of relationship. If they still refuse to listen, they could still refuse to listen. You've taken a brother, a sister, some trusted ones with you. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. The situation is getting more difficult. We can't get through to this person. They still won't act on their sin. If that happens, well, tell it to the church. Tell it to the congregation. Let the members of the community know. This is how we continue honoring each other. How we continue honoring this church that Jesus Christ is building, this church that he has committed to stand for. That's how we keep playing our part. The whole church gets involved to try and win over this brother or sister. The whole church is now a witness to the situation, adding their weight to establishing that this sin is in fact a valid offense adding their weight to the desire for reconciliation. This, dear friends, is how seriously God takes unresolved issues in the church. It's very sobering. And the objective is still to win over, to be reconciled to our brother or sister. As we read this, I, I wonder which person you naturally identify with. The offended party or the offender. Maybe as you read this, you're thinking, yeah, man, I've been offended by that person A, B, C, D, E, F, G times. And that one and that one. And, and you immediately see yourself as the offended party. I, I think the truth is, friends, we are sometimes also the offender. We're sometimes also the stubborn person who is refusing to receive correction. Who's re refusing to take the loving discipline of the community as they say, Hey brother, hey sister, what you've done here, that's not right. Sometimes that's us. I know for a fact how stubborn we can be. And I'd imagine sometimes some of us here are also stubborn. Does anyone identify with that? We're sinful. This process must be one that takes a fair amount of patience. I mean, if your goal is to win over your brother or sister, 
is there's a patience that's required here. I mean, you, you, you go to them, you're like, Jeremy, listen, man, um, I need to talk to you about something. You know that thing that happened? Well, I, I think you, what you did is, is not according to Scripture. It's not according to the Bible. And, uh, and he's like, oh, he's actually saying, I think it was. Yeah, and I'm like, and I try, and I, and I try, and I try, and it's just, I'm, I'm not getting through. And I'm like, okay, so what am I going to do? Oh, forget Jeremy. I'm just going to carry on with life. Who needs Jeremy? No, it's like, hmm, you know what? I really love Jeremy, and I want to win him over. I'm like, okay, okay, well, the Bible says I need to look for one or two other people. So, okay, so what am I going to do? Hmm, 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 hmm. Okay. I, know, I know Ricky is a, is a friend. He's a man I trust, man of integrity. So I'm going to go to Ricky and say, Ricky, listen, man, I'm struggling with, with Jeremy. This is what happened, telling you in confidence. Um, I spoke to him, and he, first of all, what, what do you think? Do you think there's anything in there, just from what I've shared? Yeah. Ricky's like, I know Jeremy, absolutely. <laughs> no, he wouldn't say that. So it's like, okay, so would you mind coming with me to, to go and speak with him. So we go and we come and we, we speak to Jeremy. And Jeremy, just check that, that, the body language there, man. Arms are folded. You are not getting through to me. This is a done deal, Sheshi. So we try and we try and we try. And it's like, oh, man, we can't get through to this man. Okay, do we wash our hands of Jeremy at this stage? No, it says, well, bring it to the church. How do I bring it to the church? Okay, um, oh yeah, maybe I'll, I think this is what I'll do. I'll go and tell the elders, because if I tell the elders, the elders lead the church. So maybe the elders can help me to kind of bring it to the whole church. So, okay, let's go to the elders, make an appointment. Okay, so here we go. Did I say make an appointment? That sounded very formal. You can just catch us at any time. Um, Hey, elders, this is what's going on. It's, it's tough. It's difficult with Jeremy. Please, can you help? We bring it to the whole church. Then there's a, okay, we're going to arrange a meeting. Everybody's going to be there. We're going to talk about this thing. That requires some level of patience and diligence and perseverance. I mean, if our desire is just to kind of wash our hands and say, you know what? We don't really care. We could... Just come up with a process that's quick and easy and messy, probably. Get this thing behind us and keep moving. But we want to be honoring of each other, honoring of the church. And if they refuse to listen, even to the church... Treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. It's possible that even after all that, all of those steps, all of that patience, all of that effort, they will not respond even to the church. They refuse. We fail to win them over. What do we do at this stage? Well, it says treat them as a pagan. At that time, here's Jesus starting his church and he's starting it with his own people, the, the Jewish people. That's how it started, with his own people. So as he, he's talking about pagans, he's talking about the Gentiles, those outside the people of Israel. So he's saying, if they refuse to listen even to the church, then treat them as if they were an outsider. Treat them as if they are not part of this community. And one respected interpretation of this is that they are excommunicated. They are removed from the community, they are no longer a part of the church. 
Now, as I, as I was thinking of that, I was, I was struggling a bit. Is that it? And I felt the Holy Spirit just remind me that as Matthew ends his gospel, he says that Jesus gave us this great commission. And the great commission was to go and make disciples of all nations, which is these pagans, these Gentiles, and to teach them to obey everything that Jesus has commanded. And uh, we've spoken quite a bit about baptism today. Yes, and to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So I'm thinking, even when they're in that state of being a pagan, an outsider, God still has a plan for them. God can still work in their lives. We might have come to the end of, of, of what we can do, but God is saying, listen, I, I still have such a big vision, which includes the pagan, includes the Gentile. And I can only trust that even in that state, the grace and mercy of God can still flow and have an impact on their lives. Treat them as a pagan or, tr- or as a tax collector. That's the other option. Pagan, tax collector. In those days, tax collectors were very unpopular because tax collectors were from among the people, the Israelites, but they were collecting their taxes often in ways that were not honorable, and they were abusing their position, making themselves rich at the expense of their own people. Not only were they collecting in ways that were less than honorable, but they were doing it on behalf of the Roman Empire that was ruling over the Israelites. So to be treated like a tax collector is to be treated like an outsider as well. Pagan tax collector. It does strike us, however, that the person who's writing these words, Matthew, was himself a tax collector. And you're thinking, man, how's he recording this? Is he like upset? Jesus, why are you making reference to tax collectors? Don't you know I was one? Well, Matthew, in his state of being a tax collector, God picks him out. He calls him out. He says, hey, you, Matthew, come follow me. And he gives him a vision for the church. He makes him one of his apostles on which he builds his church. And like, man, Jesus, yes, tax collectors are outside, But Lord Jesus, you have a way of bringing them back inside. So we can come to the end of ourselves and say, we we have tried, we have brought it all the way to the church. But if Jesus could reach out to Matthew when he was a tax collector, if this brother or sister gets to the point where we can't any longer, we can trust that God still can have a way with that person can still do something in their lives, even if perhaps we are not the ones who will be able to move the process forward. God is sovereign. Conflict happens. Conflict is part of life. As we come to a close, just to underline again, we are sinful. And because we are sinful, there will be conflict in our lives. And we can deal with conflict in a way that is dishonoring and harms the body of Christ, his church that he's building. Or... 
we can deal with conflict in a way that actually honors God. As hard as it is, as tough as it is, we can do it in a way that actually follows his commandments, his requirements, the way he says we should do it, and that brings honor to him, and that brings honor to his church. And my encouragement to us this morning is that we do it choosing the path of honor. We want to be as much on the side of Jesus and what Jesus is doing to build his church as we can. As the ladies' announcement says, we have this one life. How can we use this one life to honor Jesus and his church? Well, one of the things we can do is deal with sin among us, conflict among us, in a way that honors him. I'm going to pray. Lord, we know that none of us here is perfect. We know that none of us here has arrived with regards to resolving conflict. We are all still work in progress. We are all sinful. But Lord, thank you that you love us nevertheless and your love for us is not any less because of our weaknesses. Thank you, Lord, that we are in your family by grace. Lord Jesus, we take comfort in the fact that you have made a commitment to build your church because it is your church. And you have promised that the gates of hell, the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Lord, we take those words and we say that they are true in 2019 in Dar es Salaam. Lord, we ask today that you would help us to follow your word in this area of dealing with each other when we sin against each other. Lord, that we would start by going to that brother or sister and Lord, hopefully that it would end there. We would win each other over. Please give us the courage to do so. Please give us the strength, the humility to do so, the honor to do so. I pray, God, that even this week, where there is conflict, that we would start to take those steps, that some of us would start to take steps like that towards each other to resolve issues. Lord, where we've tried that and we've not been able to help us to find the right one or two other, the other brother or sister to help us. And Lord, we pray that at that stage, we can unlock the issue and find resolution. And God, if we have to bring it all the way to the church, help us to know how to do that to read these words and to actually know how to apply them and to make them real in our context. And Lord, if the brother or sister ends up having to be treated as a Gentile, as a pagan or a tax collector, God, we thank you that we can rest in your sovereignty knowing that you still love them and that even in that situation, you are still at work. Thank you, God, that you are with us and you are for us. May we continue to grow in being a people of honor, in being a community that honors one another for the glory 
of your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.